What is the good for man? It must be the ultimate end or object of human life, something that is in itself completely satisfying. Happiness fits this description. Since all knowledge and every pursuit aim at some good, what do we take to be the end of political science? What is the highest of all practical goods? Well, so far as the name goes, there is pretty much there is pretty much agreement. It is happiness. Say both ordinary and cultured people, and they identify happiness with living well or doing well. But when it comes to saying in what happiness consists, opinions differ, and the account given by the generality of mankind is not all like that of the wise. Former take it to be something obvious and familiar, like pleasure or money or eminence. And there are various other views. And often the same person actually changes his opinion. When he falls ill, he says that it is health. When he is hard up, he says that it is money. Conscious of their own ignorance, most people are impressed by anyone who pontificates and says something that is over their heads, have held the view that over and above these particular goods, there is another which is good in itself. And the cause of whatever goodness there is and all these others, it would no doubt be rather futile to examine all these opinions enough if we consider those which are the most prevalent or seem to have something to be said for them. I could read this passage, this excerpt 20 times. My goodness, this is brilliant. How's it going, guys? Awesome Mayo, Rhymes with KO, BigRead.com, the number one channel on YouTube for Indiana Real Estate. No big deal. We're also building the world's largest organization of special needs business owners and real estate investors. Our mission here is to build lifelong friends around the world, helping folks build generational wealth, 30 grand a month, passive income with Indiana Real Estate. Go to BigRead.com. It's amazing, beautiful, and brilliant just like me. Guys, guys, if you, we've gone over book reviews. I know this is like the least popular video I make, but the ones, for those of you that do pay attention to these book reviews, you guys are pretty serious about that. And for those of you here, how, raise your hand if you had something to do with this book review, because I don't know everything we're going to talk about here. Okay. So this gives you a sense of how many people, this book, the Nicomachean Ethics, this is a uh, a collection of 10 books um, by Aristotle. Uh, Socrates was the mentor to Plato. Plato, the mentor to Arist Aristotle. Aristotle, the mentor to Alexander the Great. This book, this collection, this is, this is considered by many to be the greatest book ever written. It is one of the most influential pieces of work ever written. How much are we going to talk about that? Um, so again, Socrates never wrote anything down. It says Plato. Plato. It should be Plato. Socrates never wrote anything down, right? So it's um, it's Plato was his best student. So we take, if we want to know what Socrates said, we have to go to Plato. But if you want to know what Plato said, go to Aristotle. That was his best student. And these guys have really shaped all thought, all philosophy, all ethics, all values, and crazy systems of thinking that the influence they've had. So Socrates, the Socratic method is named after Socrates asking questions. A uh, platonic, like I have a friend, I have a platonic relationship, right? Non-sexual, that's based on Plato, platonic. Um, also the, the theory of numbers, also Platonism, the idea that, you know, the, 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 we've talked about this on the, in, the, in the math class. Um, and Plato believed that love, actually there was a higher form of love that was beyond physical or sexual, platonic relationship. Um, and Aristotle, people that study him, Ar Ar Aristotelians, that's a cool name, right? Aristotelians, or anything related to Aristotle is called Aristotelians. This, these guys have shaped everything. And shaped so many, so much thought and so many things that have happened um, in our society. And I was not going to do anything like this. This is far beyond like the big Rhea stuff, like making 30 grand a month. Like, you know, like this just seems like it's way outside of our, our focus. But I did a book review on Seneca and that is now being used at Indiana University at Texas A&M University. Is the download is included in their suggested um, watching of uh, the interview. And I thought, man, or our review, I thought, man, how cool is that? That we put that up and I, I thought my contribution would be, and I still, I'm not saying it's anything Thing, you know, it's like there's much better people that study this that know more about this. But when you study, I've been reading this. I read this for the first time when I was a teenager. This is there are some really heavy, deep ideas here. We're gonna cover some really wild shit, man. I mean, this is like deep, deep stuff here. And when any time a book is this influential, you really need to uh, a side piece of ideas written by Aristotle. <laughs> a side piece of ideas. I saw the other one said beautiful Oslin, the former adult film star. I didn't see that on this one. The um, is it on this one? Yeah. <laughs> the um, almost the level of big reason stuff, right? This book, so considered the most important historical philosophical work ever written, big influence on, you guys see the timeline in the back, the Middle Ages. So we have the Middle Ages, medieval times, this is around 500 to 1500, about a thousand years. That was started and influenced by this this uh, this this work here. Um, when they talk about the Nicomachean Ethics, it's a series of books. So it's one book or the other has often been cited. But when we went from the Middle Ages, the Renaissance started, you can see it on the, 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 the timetable there. And then we have what's called the modernity or modern history, right? Which we have late, early and late or early, late and contemporary. Sometimes they call it. But early would be like 1500, 1800, coming around the industrial revolution, the scientific revolution. And then we have late, basically 1800 till now, which or 1800 till World War II, then World War II till now. The point being, the reason I segmented that, you look at all ha human history through mankind, every single chapter of human history, of mankind's evolution, of our developing as a society, developing as a, as a race, as a species, they consistently refer to this one work, this one, you know, this one masterpiece of ideas as being one of the heaviest, 
um, influential documents that has shaped that. The Smithsonian said um, the top uh, few, um, the top uh, writings in the last of modern history, like the last uh, 500, last 2000, 2,500 years, non-religious writings, of course, they were talking about. They had talked about the Magna Carta, the U.S. Constitution in the last 1,500 years. And then they included the uh, Nicomachean Ethics. They said, although that book wasn't written in 15, it's like 2,500 years ago, it's so influential, they actually made room for it at the Smithsonian. Uh, science, education, social norms, political, all kinds of influence that it's had. And I'm saying all this to tell you how big of a deal this book is in case you've never heard of it. Aristotle, this idea, these ideas that we're going to talk about today have shaped, anytime a book is this influential, you got to check it out, man. You got to read it. And there's a lot of brilliance here. I really don't know what we're going to cover, what we're going to talk about. To, to do this book review, I thought, man, this is going to be a bonkers review because, you know, um, the, but the, those of you that do go through the book reviews that I do, that we've done, you, I really appreciate it. You guys got so much out of these. And if you're doing that, I really think this one of all the book reviews I've done so far, um, this one was a collective effort, which I appreciate so much. Thanks, guys. Um, no, I think I, I've only got through some of the notes and they were great. He established the Lyceum. So this is to give you an idea of what their goal was. Even Aristotle knew, man, we got some badass work to do here. Explored and expounded and taught the entire field of human knowledge, logic, metaphysics, theology, history, politics, ethics, aesthetics, psychology, anatomy, biology, zoology, botany, astronomy, me meteorology, and the ancient equivalents of physics and chemistry. All right, so it's like, you know, they've got, <laughs> they've got their hands full, man, doing all kinds of stuff. Why am I spending so much talk time talking about how influential it is? Because some of this reading, honestly, especially, you know, you guys, we were talking about this earlier too. Some of this is like really heavy reading, okay? It's not like, you know, like, you know, 50 shades of gray type of stuff. Like this is not, it's like, wait a second, wait, what did I just read? What did I, like, we're gonna go, we're gonna go through this again and again, some of these excerpts, because some of this stuff is just so profound, so heavy. You gotta like stop and think about it. Like, wait, what now? What is he saying? And it's really, it's really pretty, pretty profound thinking. When you're thinking on, on terms, like if somebody told you they're building a center and they're gonna influence logic, metaphysics, politics, ethics, aesthetics, psychology, anatomy, biology, like, you'd be like, oh my gosh, like this is somebody who's like the level of thinking that you have to come up with this, this collection of ideas, this collection of books that you believe that you have contributions to make to each of these fields. And then you go out and do it. It's pretty badass. He was the Oz of his time. And this is what I'm saying. I could have just said that, saved a lot of time. My one sentence summary. <laughs> so I have one sentence summary, sums this all up. How high frequency thinking and virtue can help you realize your potential and be a better contributing member um, in a society. So this whole idea is not just how one person, but how we look at one person as a, uh, a piece of a larger organism of society and how can a society function? How can people move to their best ideals? So here's a quick one sentence summaries of each of these books here, book one through 10. So I'll say this in all the reviews we've done, all the work I've done, I've never seen anyone, I've, I've, I haven't gone through everything we're gonna go through today, but I've never seen anyone do what we're doing right here, put it in one place. And really, if you have no idea about Aristotle's works or Socrates or the Socratic method or Platonic ideas or Aristotelian ideas, if you're not familiar with that, go into this one class more than anything else to get you familiar with it. And this is pretty cool, summarizing these books in one sentence, which again is a lot, you know, a lot of weight to put on one sentence. But so book one is happiness is from virtue or excellent character. Virtue is talked about a lot. There's a lot of different applications for it. The definition of virtue depends on the time we're using it, but that's, this is basically badassery, badass stuff. Like virtue is like the best version of yourself. So whenever we use the word virtue, just imagine it is you at your best, your highest aspiration. That is virtue. So happiness is from virtue or excellent character. And there's no, really no shortcut to this. That is the top thing they talk about that. If you make decisions based on like, if you're just, you know, doing shitball and stuff or you have shitty character or compromised value system or compromised virtue and then you make decisions it doesn't matter what you do because everything you're going to do is through that lens anytime you do anything great or meaningful or significant or contributing to society it's only going to be as an accident that's why the first thing we need to do is fix our virtue and that is ultimately even if you do bad things but you do it with good virtue the, the results will end up good book two strive for virtues and not excessive shortage of character this is the goldilocks what we talk about go not too much or too little because you go too much or too little and then you end up getting weird and crazy and there's you know all kinds of bad things happen books three and four people must have internal virtues first to do virtuous deeds it's like we just said virtue starts from internal and there's a, a lot of effort a lot of emphasis placed on when people are very young placing good decision making models within them so that they can make decisions later on in life we've talked about this where when, once you figure out passive income or how to build, build businesses or anything it's so vital even if you're not that into it if you think oh my life is okay i'm okay with the money i'm making that's not good enough you gotta do it for your the next generation teach it to your kids if nothing else otherwise Otherwise, you're sentencing generations to financial darkness. Not good, not good, not good idea. Uh, not a good idea. <laughs> Book five, laws, law and rules with good leaders can bring society virtue
virtue through justice. There's a lot of emphasis about leadership and how we cultivate good leaders and how basically every person is a measure of that society's or their peers uh, value system, their virtue. And so if we want to improve a society, we need to make sure that we have good leaders that are in charge, something we're doing here in America, right? We have good people that, you know, it's an interesting thing. Your leaders of a society should be the best of you. You know what I mean? And when people talk about like, well, we shouldn't watch the news. You look at our media, you look at our politics, who in the right mind would say that those people represent the best of us, right? And that that explains so much of what, um, you know, of where we're of where we're at with the, um, you know, with the challenges. Not everything is better than it's ever been before. It's the best time to be alive. Nothing but gratitude for everything. I'm just saying the challenges we do have, it's obvious that the media creates this monster and the monster then creates the media. It's, you know, it's a self-fulfilling thing. It's This has to do with what's happening today is my point. Book six, thought, action, decision are all from virtues of thought and intention. This is the, the, the kind of one of the core ideas behind everything he says is that your thought and intention goes out. Everything you do is kind of tattooed with that. And these, these, these thoughts together, the decisions together, the thoughts you have influence your decisions and influence your actions. It's kind of a, a, um, a circular thing. And that's why we want to make sure that that internal gets fixed. Book seven, vice and other bad behavior come from lack of restraint, which steals virtue. It's talking about like sexual stuff and deviant stuff. And we're not, it, it's not that you do have good, good, good intentions. But if you don't, if you don't control the bad stuff, if you go through the excess, like the, um, they said earlier through the uh, uh, book two, if you don't fix that, then you're just going to go, the slightest whim drives you anywhere. And you think you don't have virtue. You really do, but it's, you're just not restraining the lack of it. If you restrain it a little bit better, pretty soon your virtue will take over and you'll be able to just do good things automatically. You won't have to restrain it. The reason people have a hard time restraining it is because they believe they'll have to restrain this monster indefinitely. But that's not the case. Your virtue will take over and thinking that, understanding that will help you fight your demons because you know you don't have to fight them for very long and you know your virtue will take over. Books eight through nine. Friendships should be based on virtues and similarity, not just transactional. Deep relationships. Find, build your 77s basically. He's copying off of me. Typical Aristotle. Aristotle. Aristotelians are all copying off of Big Rhea. Book 10. Humans are political. Ethics is virtue and happiness is from friends and state rules. This idea that our society, the expectations, the norms we have socially are what ultimately influence um, where we go. So this is a 10 books. Quick one sentence reviews. Let's uh, go to the le- lesson. So this is the excerpt from the first excerpt. Lesson. Humans are given more and should give more. But what is happiness? If we consider what the function of man is, we find that happiness is a virtuous activity of the soul. And we find that happiness is a virtuous activity of the soul. But presumably to say that happiness is a supreme good seems a platitude and some more distinctive account is still required. This might perhaps be achieved by grasping what is the function of man. If we take a sculptor or artist or in any general class or in general any class of men who have a specific function or activity, his goodness and proficiency are considered to lie in the performance of that function. But it is likely that whereas joiners and shoemakers have certain functions or activities, man as such has none, but has left by nature a functionless mean, but but has been left by nature a functionless being. It's a question, right? Like if we look at people, we say there's a good and bad, then what's the definition of a man? This is so, so brilliant. I love that, that uh, virtuous happiness is a virtuous activity of the soul. Just as we can see that eye and hand and foot and every one of our members have some function, should we not assume that in like manner, a human being has a function over and above these particular functions? What then can this possibly be? Clearly life is a thing shared also by plants and we are looking for man's proper function. So we must exclude from our definition, the life that consists in nutrition and growth. My gosh, this is so this idea of like, if we, if, if everything has a use, what is the use of man? It has to be more than just the use of your hands and feet and the things you have control over. There has to be a higher use. But I love this. Clearly life is a thing also shared by plants. So it can't be nutrition and growth because man, you know, we have that in common with plants. We should, we should expect more from man. Next, an order would be a sort of sentient life. But this too, we also see shared by horses and cattle and animals of all kinds. There remains then a practical life of the rational part. The idea of this is like really deep thinking of like, what is the meaning of life? There should be some central definition we have, some societal definition or government definition or state definition. But right now specifically like this, this is something we talk about constantly. We talk about passive income. One of the first things we ask people is why do you want passive income? And in almost every case, the people before they come to us, before they get trained with our stuff, we fix them. But they initially have really like lousy answers, like suboptimal answers. Like, oh, I just want to be able to go to a, you know, to be able to spend time with my family and be able, not that that's, you know, bad thing, but I'm saying they don't have any, like they're, they're, they're so that making 30 grand a month passive and passive or, you know, a hundred grand a month passively is so far beyond what they're thinking of that they haven't really thought about what would you do with that? And, you know, how would you help other people? How would you contribute to the causes you care about? When you start to dimensionalize it and really feel it, you start to feel pulled to this higher calling, this higher virtue as he's talking about. And this concept of before you die, with how much ever time you have between now and when you die, what should your life be about, right? It should be more than just living. It should be more than nutrition and growth like plants and more than just having sentient life or consciousness because cattle have that. You should ask yourself, what more do you have? What's the purpose? What's the ambition? What objective measure should be 
used between now and the day you die. I'm going over some of the stuff that I don't know if we're going to talk about later, but th this goes a lot deeper, obviously. That's a 10, 10 book thing, a 10 book collection. But this is constantly, this is in depth. This is talked about. I love some of these. I love this, the virtuous activity of the soul. This is a great thing. So we need some objective measure. The LC and the badass are the same. The only difference is thought control. That's, uh, he's copying me, Aristotle. Typical Aristotle. We must lay down that we intend here life. Okay, so this is a continuation of the same idea. We must lay down that we intend here life determined by activity because this is accepted as the stricter sense. Activity, it's what you do that matters, right? Now, if the function of man is an activity of the soul in accordance with or implying a rational principle, and if we hold that the function of an individual and of a good individual of the same kind, e.g. of a harpist and a good harpist and so on generally, is generically the same, the latter's distinctive excellence being attached to the name of the function because the function of the harpist is to play the harp, but that of the good harpist is to play it well. What's that? <laughs> okay. All right, we'll, we'll slow down for a second. Okay, so so basically what he's saying is that they're, they're the same person. Uh, some, a basketball player, you can play basketball, you can play basketball really well. You can play basketball brilliantly. It's basically the same person. But if we're looking at the the excellence being attached to the name, the, the generically, the latter is distinctive. The reason why someone does something great, excellence being attached to the name of the function because the function of the harpist is to play the harp, but the, 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 uh, the good harpist is to play it well. And if we assume that the function of man is a kind of life, namely an activity or a series of actions of the soul, implying a rational principle. And if the function of a good man is to perform these well and rightly, and if every function is performed, okay, I will explain in a second. Let's finish this though. And if every function is performed well when performed in accordance with its proper excellence, if all this is so, so if you follow all that, the conclusion is that the good for man is an activity of the soul in accordance with virtue, or if there are more kinds of, or that there are more kinds of virtue in accordance with the best and most perfect kind. So read this again slowly. If we assume that the function of a man is a kind of life, basically a good, a, a normal basketball player and a great basketball player, right? They're both doing the same thing, but it's the way that one does it that we're, we're, the, the distinction is the excellence being attached to the name, right? So look at life the same way. You can live life normally or you can live life brilliantly and do great things, right? And what's the difference, right? It's the, the same person. This is constantly talked about where it's not the person. Often we attach, we think, oh, that guy's just a great guy instead of he's doing great things because he has great thoughts, right? It's like, uh, um, what is it? Uh, Ep Ep Epictetus said, to do beautiful things, you must have beautiful thoughts. And um, this really, this is, there's, this is deep stuff here. This is really an activity or a series of actions of the soul and plan a rational principle. If the function of a good man is to perform these well and rightly, and if every function is performed well when performed in accordance with its proper excellence. So you can do it when you, you're going to, you're always going to do badass stuff if you connect to the universe. If you, if you're, you know, you're connected to the deep current, right? You're always going to do great things. So the question is then how do you connect to that more often and do more things from that place, this place of virtue? And if there are more kinds of virtue than one in accordance with the best and most perfect kind. In other words, you can live life, you can live life great. The difference is going to be what you tap into, the virtue or the energy or the whatever you want to call it. We would call it in our case, we call it the, your thought control, right? Your high frequency thinking. If you tap into that and if you have multiple thoughts available, pick the highest, the best and most perfect kind. That in accordance with that, in accordance with your soul and in accordance with what you should be doing that's happiness, which is again, the virtuous activity of the soul. When you do things with that from that place, when you're from the, that place mentally, emotionally, that's when you do badass stuff. Make sense? So the difference between living life and great life, the same person can do both. It's what they tap into, the thoughts they tap into. And there's a further qualification for attaining eudaimonic happiness. So eudaimonic, the two types of happiness basically in all psychology, hedonism, like hedonic and eudaimonic. Hedonic is like sexual, um, hedonism, you know, it's just like very topical. And then eudaimonic is the deep, the purposeful, the meaning life. They constantly talk about eudaimonic. I don't know if we're going to talk about more in this, but this is a very heavy eudaimonic happiness is really one of the, the that's synonymous with uh, the whole, the whole work here. There's a further qualification for attaining eudaimonic happiness in a complete lifetime. One swallow does not make a summer, neither does one day. Similarly, neither can one day or a brief space of time make a man blessed and happy. Moral virtues like crafts are acquired by practice and habituation. This con this I this quote here at the bottom, what we are, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. This is a huge famous one. Have you guys heard this before? This is a famous quote that's uh, attributed to Aristotle. He didn't actually say that. What he said is what we just read before, that um, one swallow does not make a summer, neither does one day. Similarly, neither can one day or a brief space of time make a man blessed and happy. Moral virtues are like crafts. They are, are, are required by practice and habituation. This idea, this is so in line with everything. When I was reading this again, I was thinking, man, this is exactly what we do. Is this not high frequency thinking, thought control, get up there and take action from that place, right? That emotional place and do it again and again. And eventually that's where you live. That's basically what he's saying here. Um, lesson, calibrate and find Goldilocks levels. Rash people are impetuous, eager before danger revives, but shifty when it is actually present. <laughs> Whereas courageous ones are keen at the time of action, but calm beforehand. This much then is clear. In all our conduct, it is the mean. It is the mean that is to be commended. The mean, like the average. But one should incline sometimes towards excess and sometimes toward deficiency, because in this way we shall most easily hit upon the mean. That is the right course, the right course of action. A cardinal rule, right conduct 
product is incompatible with excess or deficiency. This is what we talked about. This is book two or three, when it, or four, I don't know which one it was, that don't go too much or too little. First, then we must consider this fact that it is in the nature of moral qualities that they are destroyed by deficiency or excess. Just as we can see, since we have to use the evidence of visible facts to throw light on those that are invisible. This is one of the famous lines here. To use the, uh, to, we have to use the evidence of visible facts to throw light on those that are invisible. This idea that if you take action, they talk about this later, even if you don't know what the most virtuous thing to do is, if you don't know what the best, the most badass, the correct thing to do is, see the, the, uh, of the options you have, pick the most correct thing. And when you do that, it'll throw light on those things that are invisible, those good virtuous ideas that are, inv- that are, that are not available right now. In the case of health and strength, for both excessive and insufficient exercise destroy one's strength, and both eating and drinking too much or too little destroy health, whereas the right quantity produces, increases, and preserves it. Being right there, we talk about this a lot with our gamification. If you're trying to improve, don't go too much or too far, because if your next level, if it's too hard, you're just going to quit. You have to be right at the edge of your capability and getting better and better. That's what keeps you in that spiral. So it is the same with temperance, courage, and other virtues. The man who shuns and fears everything and stands up to nothing becomes a coward. The man who is afraid of nothing at all, but marches up to every danger becomes foolhardy. Similarly, the man who indulges in every pledge and refrains from none becomes licentious. But if a man behaves like a boar and turns his back on every pleasure, he is a case of insensibility. Thus, temperance and courage are destroyed by excess and deficiency and preserved by the mean. Stay in that Goldilocks level. And this is also reference to any kind of thing that's being done that you were talking about this earlier about making calls or do anything. When you, If you look at where you're at right now, when he was talking about this earlier, making 15, 20, um, 77s, uh, you know, every 48 or 72 hours. If you looked at that at the very beginning, it'd make you vomit, right? You think, oh, there's no way I can do that. I can't make that many calls. I can't talk to that many people. I can't put out that many signs. I can't do that many deals. I can't have that many closings. I can't have that many appraisals. I can't get, you know, borrow that many, uh, borrow that much money or close that many, you know, have that many closings lined up because at the beginning, it seems impossible. And if you have too much of it, you're going to quit. But if you go slowly bit by bit and over time, you actually end up being, it's the, like the crafts, habituation and practice, and you end up being able to do it and swallowing bigger and bigger demons. There's so much to this, man. It's really, really good stuff here. Uh, momentum answers everything. Act now. By common consent, the beginning is more than half the whole task. <laughs> oh my gosh. There's, I've read like 10 things that I kept, I kept reading on, but I was like, man, as I read it, this is one of those. By common consent, I remember when you sent this to me, I read that. And I just, I stared at this. I was like, man, I, I remember reading that a while ago, but this wasn't in my, my notes, my summary. So I'm glad you included it. By common consent, the beginning is more than half the whole task. It's like 90%. By common consent, the beginning is more than half the whole task. This is, oh, this is, by by common consent, the beginning is more than half the whole task and throws a flood of light on many of the aspects of the inquiry. Again, when you don't know what to do, just move forward and light gets flooded onto the next path and the, the best path forward. Those states are praiseworthy. Those states that are praiseworthy, we call virtues, more we call virtues. Moral virtues like crafts are acquired by practice and habituation. So too, it is easy to get angry. Anyone can do that or to give and spend money, but to feel or act toward the right person to the right extent at the right time for the right reason, the right way, that is not easy. And it is not everyone that can do it. Hence, to do these things well is rare, laudable, and fine achievement. Again, it's not just doing something once, acting the right way towards a person or towards an idea or towards a goal, but doing it collectively over time. I love this. The right person or the right thing, the right goal, the right extent at the right time for the right reason in the right way, the right extent. This is this is good. Now our definition is in harmony with those who say that happiness is virtue or a particular virtue because an activity in accordance with virtue implies virtue. An activity in accordance with virtue implies virtue. But presumably, it makes no little difference whether we think of the supreme good as consisting in the possession or in the exercise of virtue. Oh my gosh. But presumably, did you get that? Is that what you're talking about? Right. This is such a great... Now, our definition is in harmony with those who say that happiness is a virtue, right? Or a particular virtue. Because an activity in accordance with virtue implies virtue. Just, it implies it, right? But next sentence, presumably, it makes no little difference, it makes a big difference, whether we think of the supreme good as consisting in the possession or the exercise or in the exercise of virtue. It's not just the possession of it, it's the exercise of it. In a state of mind or in an activity. For it is possible for the state of mind to be present in a person without affecting any good result, e.g. if he is asleep or quiescent in some way, but not for the activity. We He will, he will necessarily act and act well. Just as the Olympic Games and is not the best looking of the strongest men present that are crowned with wreaths, but the competitors, because it's from the competitors, it is because it is from them that the winners come. <laughs> yeah, gotta be a competitor. Because it is from them that the winners come. So it is those who act that rightly win the honors and rewards in life. You gotta move, man. You gotta make things happen. I love this line. It makes no little difference whether we think of the supreme good as consisting in the possession or in the exercise of virtue. It is the exercise of it. You got to do it. You got to make it happen, man, because the competitors, it is from them that the winners come. Oh my goodness. Less than chase a crazy idea. Greatness of soul, as the very name suggests, is concerned with things that are great. And we must first grasp of what sort these are. It makes no difference whether we consider the disposition or the person who 
corresponds to it. Well, a person who corresponds to it, period. Well, a person is considered to be magnanimous if he thinks that he is worthy of great things, provided he is worthy of them. Because anyone who esteems his own worth unduly is foolish, and nobody who acts virtuously is foolish or stupid. Huh. The magnanimous man, then, is as we have described him. Magnanimous, right? The man who is worthy of little consideration and thinks he is such is temperate, but not magnanimous. Because magnanimity, 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 that's it. Magnanimity implies greatness, just as beauty implies a well-developed body, like awesome male. Did he say that? Aristotle said that? How did he know? The man who thinks that he is worthy of great things, although he is not worthy of them, is conceited. But not everybody is conceited who has too high an opinion of his own worth. I've been reading this to myself. You guys following this? Long? Okay, if you, if you just say something for if we're off. The man who thinks he is worthy of great things, but also he is not worthy of them, is conceited. But not everybody is conceited who has too high an opinion of his own worth. On the other hand, the man who has too low an opinion is pusillanimous. <laughs> right? This is what she was talking about. Did you hear what she said? No. Next to it, it was pussy lame ass, which pusillanimous sounds exactly what you think it sounds like. It means exactly what you think. Pusillanimous. It makes no difference whether his worth is great or moderate or little. We should be using that more often, pusillanimous. Because it sounds fancy, but everyone knows what it means. It makes no difference whether his worth is great or moderate or little. If his opinion of it is too low. Indeed, the man whose worth is great might be regarded as especially pusillanimous. Because the, what would his behavior be if his worth were not so great? Oh my goodness. Think about it. Okay. Indeed, the man whose worth is great might be regarded as especially pusillanimous. Because what would his behavior be if his worth were not so great? It's like you have this greatness in you and you're acting like an LC. Imagine if you didn't have that greatness in you, it'd be even worse. So although the magnanimous man is an extreme as regards the greatness of his claims, as regard its rectitude, he is a mean because he estimates himself at his true worth. Others show excess or deficiency. So again, believing that you're destined for greatness, maybe that's not a bad, like that's not necessarily, you're not necessarily being a fool if you actually have that. There's the bigger, the other excerpt from this is the idea that when you tap into virtue, when you tap into the, it is the, what Socrates called the great knowledge. You can, anyone can tap into it. The biggest secret that I know, I don't know if we're going to talk about this later, about the high frequency thinking, it is tapping into this at will. This idea when he talks about virtue and happiness, if you tap into this, everything you do, you, you are able to access the past, the future, the present, all space and time essentially. And I'm not even paraphrasing. This is what, you know, Plato and Socrates talk about this. So does Tesla, Steve Jobs, Azamel, all the great thinkers, all the great minds, right? That this, the being able to do this, it's not about having arrogance, about having this magnanimous claim or believing that you have this great soul, um, magna, great, animus, soul. Magnanimous is it often seen, is seen as negative, but it is the idea that you are capable of influencing change and improving other people's lives. And that's what you were meant to do. And having that as your destiny, what you love, what the world needs and what you're good at. The destiny diagram, right? This is that 101. Exactly. How are we doing on time, by the way? Are we good on time? What is this? Uh, oh, is this is this meant to be on this session? Is this, are we talking about this now? Okay. Okay, guys. Like I said, I've had this, this is a whole nother class we're going to be doing about this, about high frequency thinking. This is the biggest secret I've ever learned. I've read more books than pretty much any human being you'll ever meet. I've been doing this stuff for a long time about getting people to perform, outperform what they have what they think is possible, all kinds of badass stuff. Getting people to do badass stuff, something I've done for a long time. I say all that to qualify what I'm about to say now. This right here, how long, how much are we going to get into this? Are we actually going over the diagrams and stuff? If you don't know the story, um, I have uh, Jay, my son, he's adopted. He's I only say he's adopted because I wasn't there from the beginning. But when I did get there, we had all kinds of issues. We went to a neurologist and got all kinds of uh, tests done. And it was until I figured this out, he was able to, we had this, um, basically he was got this diagnosis. He was not going to be able to go back to public school. I had to take him to a center, basically. I put him in a, a straight jacket in a room, a padded room all day. And then we were able to reconfigure something. We tried, I, we spent all kinds of money going to every kind of professional there was. There's a, I, I only say that because now some people are like, well, how bad was it? Was he really, man, it was violence. It was self-harm. It was self, the, the, you, the, for you in America, for them to say that your kid can't go back to public school, man, you know what that, because all I had to do was turn around and say, okay, well, you guys pay for it to have them institutionalized and they would have had to. They don't say this lightly, man. It's not easy to get that diagnosis. They, you know, he's not just a, a brat that needs a spanking. I mean, it's serious stuff. They only do it if you're a threat to yourself and or others. And if, by threat, they say not just like, oh, you're going to slap someone, but like you might actually, you might actually kill someone, including yourself. And it's, it's, it, I'm not blaming anyone, by the way, it's fair. You just want to teach people like kids and you want to teach them like, you know, how to spell and coloring books and like handwriting and stuff. You don't want to be like stopping a kid from stabbing the kid next to him or stabbing himself. And that's, I don't want to talk about how I won't get, I've gotten into the details elsewhere. I maybe I'll make another video and talk about all the details. Anyway, the, all I'm saying is what solved it, then his neurologist showed me his brain scans. And I was like, oh my gosh, I became totally obsessed. I've been like an amateur neurologist now. I, I started my internship at my, at my, uh, at our neurology uh, center, a cardiologist.
cardiologist, a cardio surgeon cuts you open, does heart surgery, right? A cardiologist doesn't cut you open, but they study your heart wave. They study your EKG. If you go like the stress test on a treadmill and they look at the wave, this wave right here, right? They look at your wave. This is super important because a cardiologist and a cardiac surgeon, they get paid about the same amount, 500 grand. So the cardiologist cuts you open, the cardio, or the cardio surgeon cuts you open, the cardiologist looks at your wave. This is called a wave, right? A cardiologist looks at this wave and they can tell by looking at your wave. They don't need to talk to you. They don't need to ask you any questions. They can tell you how old you are. They can tell you how many kids you have. They can tell you uh, your college, your, your degree, uh, whether you went to college or not. They can tell you what income class you're in. They can tell you if you work out. They can tell you what kind of diet you have. They can tell you your details about your sex life. They can tell you uh, your height, your weight. They can tell you uh, what your parents were like. They can tell you the, the, the diet you had when you were a child. They can tell you what race you are, where you were born, what countries you were likely to be born, the longitude and latitude. It's all likelihood. I mean, it's not going to be 100%, but they can tell all of that just by looking at your boom, 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 your heart rate, right? There's that much data contained in that little bit of energy, right? I'm telling you that because a neurosurgeon is a brain surgeon. A neurologist is like a cardiologist. They don't cut you open. What do they do? They look at the wavelengths here. They have just like, you know, you put those sensors on your chest and you get on the treadmill and it, your, your heart has a wave and energy, boom, 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 boom. That's an energy wave that they can measure. Your brain has waves constantly. And if you put a shower cap on, that's how they measure these waves. That's what I've been doing, okay? So you've probably heard of the law of attraction, what you think about will come about the secret, the movie, the secret stuff like that. The problem with those people, they get kind of weird, right? Like let's take our shoes and socks off so we can be closer to the earth, like bonkers stuff. Like, oh gosh, like, you know, they'll tell you just, you know, I've always, I believe that positive thinking, all that stuff. I'm into that stuff, but can we mathematically prove it? That's what we're doing right now. This field that's generated, how strong is it? And how, how, you know, how much, how much, what is the mathematical, how big is it? And how strong is it outside of your body? And what's the math behind it? How many times do you have to think about a Lamborghini, for example, before you have one? And what do you have to do? It's what you do say and think are kind of our, our vortex of action here. I'm saying all that to qualify what I'm saying now. So what Socrates or what Aristotle, all these people are talking about this high frequency thought. This is the biggest secret I've learned. This is how we're getting our special needs heroes to over outperform even their, their normal quote unquote counterparts. All of this is the secret to all of the work we've been doing lately. So this is the lowest. You have delta, theta, alpha, beta, gamma. These are the main five ways, the main five energy levels. So one of these, to, I, I went through this in the quantum physics class. I don't know how much I should go through right now, but if I hook you up to it, if I put that shower cap on you and I look at your brain, the qual the frequency of your thoughts, we have a low frequency here. Frequency is determined by hertz, which means in one second, how much, how many times does this move? So one to five hertz means we have basically your, your heart rate is about BPM, the beats per minute. So if it's 60 beats per minute, that's one hertz, one every second, right? So one to five hertz, if your brain wave is that level, that's a very low level, like you're asleep, right? Then we have theta means you're barely awake. That's five to 10 hertz. I can measure this, by the way, if we have a shower cap on you. Right now, you're probably alpha to beta, hopefully, meaning you're paying attention. Alphas, you're awake. Normally, people are in alpha state. But then beta state is when you get triggered, you're paying attention, you're taking notes, you've become, something has been triggered in you, you're paying a lot more attention, right? Like a, a scary movie, right? When that the, the killer, you know, the girls that just got, got woken up, you know, out of the shower or whatever. Why would she be sleeping in the shower? She gets startled in the shower. She goes out and she's looking for that big, scary monster. And you're like, right on the edge of your seat. That's, that's beta, right? Alpha is where you normally are just to pay attention. Make sure you don't run into anyone. Make sure you don't, you know, walk in on, you know, what am I saying? Why do I keep going to like sexual stuff? You, do, you don't run into someone. You don't drive your car off a cliff or whatever. That's, you got to pay attention. You got to be an alpha. Theta is like if you're just woken up and you, you know, I don't talk to me until I have my coffee or my cigarette or whatever. Um, That would be theta. Alpha is you are awake. You're in a normal state. You should be at least an alpha right now. Beta is when you're paying attention, right? Then the highest frequency thinking here is gamma, 38 to 50 hertz. Now, what that means is that this is what that wave looks like. In that same one second, look at this. We have many more waves. So that same one second, instead of having one, one wavelength, one completion from here to here, we have 38, we have 50, right? We're going, da, 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 it's going brrr, much faster, much, much, much quicker thinking, much higher frequency thinking, a, a, a HFT, high frequency thinking. When you hit this level of gamma, you have basically what everyone is talking about, what Steve Jobs called the reality distortion field, what Tesla called the source, what Da Vinci called the uh, the sky, um, or, or what Hero called the sky, what uh, Socrates called the great knowledge, what Aristotle called virtue and the place of virtue, the, 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 the source of virtue. This is, everyone knows what gamma feels like. You have chills, you have butterflies. Athletes call it being in the zone. The problem that most people have, and what I didn't realize until recently, until with Jay, and now I, when I saw Jay's results, and I thought, man, not only was he able to compete, not have any meltdowns, get back to school, and the, the, when I when we went back to school, I told him, I said, listen, he's not going to have any more meltdowns. You're not going to have any more issues with him. And his teacher's like, yeah, I believe you, I, because she saw some of these results we were having. And it went one week. It, now, keep in mind, he hadn't gone one day without having a meltdown, right? He went a full week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, 
weeks, five weeks, six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks, nine weeks. Uh, his friends, other uh, kids with special needs parents were coming up to me asking, what did you do? Do you mind doing it with me? I started this work by doing it in family rooms and living rooms, very informal in people's houses, right? It wasn't, you know, I'm still kind of doing that now, but I mean, it was very informal. I'm still very informal now. We work with very, you know, small number of people and we're writing our books. We have now, we're on our volume three of all our success stories and heroes of all kinds of really cool stuff. It's all based on this, okay? This, and even before I knew I was doing this, I was doing this. This is how, why, some people, you know, are always on cloud nine. They're always full of gratitude and love and compassion and caring and kindness and they see nothing but potential, opportunity and possibility. This is what they're doing. They're getting to gamma. If you, if I hook you up to a shower cap right now, I don't even need to talk to you. I can just look at your hurts. I can tell you where you're at. And if you think about something, what, what, are we going to go more into this? Because the, the real secret here, when I looked at Jay's stuff, right? And I started working with other uh, young people, very young people, you know, five, six, seven years old, 10 years old, and then older people, eventually adults. The question here is, can you do that on purpose? Can you get to the gamma on purpose? Can you do this at will? Can you get chills, butterflies? Can you get that feeling of unstoppability at will? And guys, I'm here to tell you, yes, you can. And that's the big secret here is that you can get to that place where Aristotle's talking about a virtue of living through your soul, coming from your heart. You can do it at will. The more you do it, the easier it becomes. You can get there in seconds and you keep getting there. And eventually your brain will remodel itself to be there. And as you do it, as you think about something, your brain will start attracting other thoughts, dendrites. We also talked about myelin and uh, oligodendrocytes in one of our uh, previous book reviews. All the things about the brain, the main thing is the dendrites. Because once those dendrites start performing, all of a sudden, the more you think about something, the more, the easier it becomes to think about. And the more other thoughts become through that lens. If you watch the news and you're shitballing all day, everything you look at is through the news and through this uh, you know idea of division and hatred and resentment. And everything you look at, you need to find the world, things in the world that support your worldview. And the more you do that, the more you will summon things into your world that support what you're thinking. The higher frequency your thinking is, the more you think about something, the more you're going to see it in the world, but then the more you're going to not just attract it, but summon it. You're going to demand it. You're going to command that the universe brings it into your world. I know that sounds pretty bonkers. And I start getting that place. Let's take our shoes and socks off to be close to the earth. Go through my class in quantum physics. Consciousness, it does affect reality on a very a subatomic level. There's a whole other thing I talk about. I'm only going to talk about the brain right now because what we're studying right now is how big is that field outside of your body? Because there's no doubt when you think about high frequency thinking, it creates a field around you. It creates a field in your brain, but it also goes outside of your body. The question we're looking at right now is how much outside of your body and how strong of a pull is it? To give you an idea what the experiments we're doing right now, we have people hooked up and we're just, we're not even telling them anything about big Rhea, Inca, they don't know anything. They just see me. They think I'm just, you know, a retired supermodel or whatever. Retired. I know it's crazy. They wouldn't think I'm retired, but they, they, they look at me, have no idea who I did, like what I'm doing or anything. We just say, look, why don't we just think about certain things here? We'll get your gamma going a little bit, two to three times a week and just tell us what happens in your life. And the stories people come back with are amazing. Once you get your frequency of thought up, you will command the world around you to match your thinking. So here's how this looks. Down here, we have negative delta theta. Then we have alpha beta, like we talked about. And then at the top is where we have gamma. This is where you need to live at the gamma. The more you get here, the easier it'll be to be, the more you think about something, the easier it is to think about, and the more it attracts other thoughts like it, and then things outside your body, outside your mind, outside your immediate, your field that's created. It's an interesting thing. The more people, this is absolutely true now, people come into Big Rhea stuff, even if we don't become, even if we don't work together, just coming into our world and your life will immediately improve. Watch it happen. The next seven to 10 days, if this is your first video, you'll see major improvements happening. So here we have, the, this is how it looks like, kind of our chart of thoughts here. At the very bottom, when you are at your worst, what do you feel? It's resentment. It's it's pessimism. It's a limited. It's a smallness, right? That's at the bottom. This is where we have blame, limited, all, always limitations. We have anger. We have fear. As we move up to a more, more of a neutral place, getting a little bit better, then we start having settling acceptance. And then we start building at the very top of this neutral. When we get towards beta, we have momentum. We have happiness. Ever notice when you're learning something, you're paying attention to that movie, you feel better. You have more momentum. You're able to do other things better. You feel better about yourself, about others, and about the future. Then we start having thinking and reasoning. This is where we have, we're starting to trigger our beta. At the very top of that, when we're moving towards the 38 to uh, 50 hertz, right? When we're getting up to the 57 hertz, we're getting to the gamma. This is where you start to feel unstoppable. You start to feel courage, opportunity, optimism. And at your best, if I ask you, when was the best time in your life? That time, generally, you were filled with the most love and gratitude. This right here, most people wait for the thing. We all have an emotional home. And what we do all day is we look for things that happen externally to help us go where we want to be internally, right? So if you're a shit ball, if you're down here in the resentment place, all you're going to do is find things in the world and summon them into your world that are going to keep you down there. That's where you're comfortable. That's the city that you've built. That's the cathedral of thought that you have. But the better you get up here to love and gratitude, you know you know this. There's the best of us, the best people among us, no matter what happens, no matter what you throw out of they always come out with the W, right? They always seem to win. They've got nothing but gratitude. They come back. What happens to them does not affect how they feel. How they feel affects what happens 
happens to them. It affects the world, right? This is what anyone can do at will here. We have contraction. You always feel small, tight, and you kind of get your physical, your, the physiology of your body. You'll hang your head. Your eyes will be low. You'll start talking like this. All these things happen. What you think, say, and do brings you down to resentment. Expansion. When you feel bigger, you play bigger. You take up more space. The more you have. What do we do when we all when we win something? What do we do? We take up more space. We do the victory. The the the, the arms in the air. The V. Across cultures, across time, we all do this. We take up more space. We expand more. So there's physical differences we can see. If I have someone sitting down and have the shower cap on, I ask them if you if some goal they have. They want to get in shape. They want to have a better relationship with their parents. They want to make billion dollars or whatever. And I say, okay, think about that for a second. What's what would you be doing? They say, well, I would be driving a Lamborghini. Okay, what would you smell? Think of one sense: your sight, smell, touch, taste, hear. Think of one sense and really focus on that one sense. It's amazing if you think about the taste of a strawberry. If you think about it long enough or hard enough, your mouth will start to water. Your thoughts. Think about how amazing that is. We'll have a physical manifestation in the real world. You can see saliva. You can taste it. Right? It's something we can measure. But the question is, how far outside of your body does that go? And how long and hard do you need to think about it? How far? This is what we're tracking now. How long do you have to be a gamma thinking about something before it actually somehow manifests in your life, or at least the path towards it, the opportunity towards it? Right? So if you start focusing on these thoughts, when we talk specifically about love, gratitude, we start thinking of expanding yourself. Focus on what it would smell like if you had a great relationship with your brother and you sat down and ate apple pie together. Focus on how that smells and how he looks, and just take or just just focus on the smell, just on one sensation, right? Smell or what you see or what you hear, anything or what you taste. Focus on that. Just really take a second, really think about any goal you have. Take one sense and go with it, and you'll physically feel a difference in your body. We see this again and again with people. They take up more space. Oh, they feel better. They we all all human beings, and again, this has been throughout history. Every great mind I've ever read about, all they all talk about this, but nobody's been able to mathematically quantify it until recently. They haven't had the technology to. So, am I better than Socrates? I don't. Yes, that's what I'm saying. So, right here at the very top, what do we have? We have joy, hope, passion, knowledge, enthusiasm for life, appreciation, undying gratitude, expecting and creating the best things to happen, great outcomes always, seeing and summoning resourcefulness. What are you doing? Are you taking? Are you taking notes? Oh, I thought you were. I thought you said he was leaving. No, I thought you. I didn't know what you were doing. Oh, I appreciate that. I didn't know you guys were even still back there. I thought. I thought I saw you. Okay, so you guys know this stuff though, right? What do we have? Joy, hope, passion, knowledge, enthusiasm, appreciation, seeing, summoning, resourcefulness. Sun Tzu said, well, I said it, then he stole it from me, that the ultimate resource is resourcefulness. Anything to add to this, by the way? Because this is exactly what, it doesn't matter the situation you're in. I promise you, I know people have got all kinds of reasons to shit ball and all. Listen, man, you are in America. Have some fucking gratitude. You know, appreciate the fact that I'm putting this video out right now that, that I, you know, I am living everything I'm talking about. The only reason we do this is because I know the, the, the only reason to do it for free, I guess, is that I know the difference this makes. I know that it has been my, I've been touched by the universe, by God to do this, to, to do the work we're doing right now. And everything I've done has led up to this. And I could tell you crazy stories of how things link together and how things, it's amazing. How many, think about this. I've spent my entire like career or whatever you want to call it, working on like cold calling, dialogue, screening, like providers and stuff. How crazy is it that recently, and this is all in the last couple of years where I started working with Jay and then other special needs. That's how I met Anna. She heard she's a special needs instructor. That's how I met her. And everything I have done, it was like I was making a key and all these people, especially like our heroes, our special needs heroes, they all were stuck behind a door and they didn't they didn't know it was a door. And then I have had, just so happens that I've got the one key that opens this door. Because if you have handicap, or you have mental illness, or you have any of these things, and you really, there are limitations you have to being able to have a normal job, right? But if we can just focus on your thoughts, if we can just focus on the fact that you can communicate and talk and over the phone, ideally, or just through email, you can build, you can do it. You can get to 10, 20, 30 grand a month. This is what ultimately what people want to have is the ability to go out and live their dreams. And when they see this stuff, like, oh my gosh, this is my destiny. For the first time, I realized I don't have to depend on my parents or the government or, you know, whatever, or, you know, just charity. I can actually go out and build something. And this is nothing. I just, I tell you, man, it's when you think about this, you could be filled with nothing but gratitude. It's illegal to not have nothing but gratitude, to have access to this material, to have access to these stories, to have access to these people. And to be alive at this time, man, it's, it's really something. And gratitude will fix everything, man. Love and gratitude, enthusiasm. You can get there in seconds. That is the secret to everything I'm saying. You want to be an LC? It's the same thing. I'm frustrated. Awesome. Doesn't work in my area. Awesome. Disappointment. Oh, always, oh, always down. Weariness. Worry. Worrying about shit that never happens. Always
always overwhelmed. The LC is always overwhelmed. Oh man, I'm just, I don't know what to do. It's just, oh, I don't, you know, it's always overwhelmed. Expecting, creating the worst outcomes. They're always, everything is always, oh, with my luck, I'm gonna be, oh, well, you know, Murphy's Law. It's, and it's true. For them, it's always true. The fact is, if you can change the quality of your thinking, if you can raise the tone of your thought, if you raise the frequency of your thinking, the mathematical frequency of your thinking, right? You might not have a shower cap at your house that tracks your math, your, your thinking. You might not have that stuff. You might not have access to that stuff, but what you do have is the ability to measure what I just said. You know how it feels and you know the thoughts that can trigger that. And then when you get with someone who's trained, we do this quite a bit now. I've trained many people to do this. We can get to the gamma instantly. I can train you to get other people to the gamma. You don't even need to talk to them. You can look at where they're at and you can tell them, yeah, you're there now. Now think about the shitty thing about how terrible everything is and how awful human beings are, whatever. And they come right down. We can see their frequency of thought come right down. It's not that difficult to do. And it's not that difficult to fix. And this is ultimately, if you want to live the highest and best version of yourself, this is a secret. Focus on your thought control. Formula for the LC. Focus. If you want to be an LC, this is what you do. Focus on yourself. Just you. It's all about you. Don't, don't focus on anybody else. Just go, oh, I don't know what I want to do with my life. Focus on the short term. And the LC is always like, oh, I got to make money right now. I, I know what you're saying. I was going to build my business over the next three to five, whatever. I get that. Passive income over five years. I got money right now. Always a dickhead. And focus on the lack of possibility potential. It's a bad time. The market's, you know, in, you know overwhelmed. There's a crash coming. There's too much competition. They always, whenever they're done talking, you always feel like you're worth less. We have, we have this old joke. We say, draw a circle. That represents everything you think you're capable of. In your life, you're only going to meet one of two people. People that make that circle bigger and people that don't. And that's, you should choose your friends carefully. When you meet the best people, they always make you feel like you're capable of more within seconds. That you feel like you got wings and you could fly. And this is the key to do that. Bring yourself up here. Get your frequency of thought up here and you will be one of those people. The formula for badassery, focus on others. No matter what's going on in your life, immediately focus on somebody else. Be thankful. Marcus Aurelius said, don't say, oh, why this happened to me? Be thankful it's happening to me because I'm dealing with it better than somebody else would. And I'm thankful that I'm able to do it in a way that can be inspiring to somebody else. Um, it's just great stuff, man. Focus on others. Focus on the long term. Don't think about right now. Focus on, when I go over this stuff right now, this is, we are right now, our work is shaping not just the next 100 years, the next 200 years, the next 300 years, based on just some of the success stories we had in the last 30 days, because they'll be better parents who will create better parents. And you start taking that effect out. Why look at the work and say through the myopic lens of it only affects today? It's not, it's long term. It's a long term residual effect, 100, 200 years. Start thinking in terms of Aristotle. What's that? What's that? What did you write there? What did you write there? Right, everything is energy. Energy is everything. Every, let me read this note. Here's a couple of notes that she had put there. Everything is energy at different frequencies, right? Everything is, when we, our brain is a translator, your brain is a translator that intercepts, that interprets frequencies as physical, physical things like a chair, a hat, whatever, right? Computer, but everything is vibrating, right? So everything has a frequency. So do your thoughts, each one of your thoughts. But if you break it down, everything is vibrating and has a specific frequency. Every single thought you have has a specific frequency. Good thought has high frequency, negative thoughts have low frequency. I hate you versus I love you. I hate you actually takes more out of you, contracts you more than I love you. Thoughts have frequency and this will resonate. Whatever thoughts you have, it's like that footprint. We always call it the, when the T-Rex is stomping in Jurassic Park and the water, you know, the water jiggles, right? That's what your thoughts are. Your thoughts are that T-Rex and that vibrates through your entire body. All of the trillions of cells in your body are always listening to how you think because that's what they react to. So they resonate throughout your, body, throughout your entire body and affect how you feel. High frequency thinking will attract other thoughts of that similar frequency, like attracts like. This is the law of attraction, like attracts like. More thoughts of that same frequency, but that doesn't just stop in your head because that's what we're talking about right now, the field that's created. Because all of your thoughts, this frequency all adds up. It's collective and it creates a field of frequency around you. It absorbs, if you all you do, if all you do is take in, whatever you absorb is gonna be what you take in. So if you take in bad news, you think about it, you talk about it with others, all you're gonna find is evidence in your world and evidence that supports that worldview will actually find you. And when you talk to somebody who doesn't have that, who's not thinking about that, you're gonna be thinking, oh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, they, They're gonna be so distasteful to you because their frequency, their field is so misaligned with yours and you don't know what you're doing. You're creating the very thing that you hate, that you that you claim you hate, but because shitballing feels so good. This is why the LCs always love the LCs. Every time you say something, every time you think something, every time you do something, you're sending a bat signal, not just to yourself, but to the people around you. You're either bringing great badass people into your life or the opposite, you're bringing LCs. What's that? No, the, ener the energy and the frequency of thoughts, the, whatever the, the energy they have, their frequency of thought, their high frequency thinking is totally alien to you. The collective thoughts you have create a field and that field is either high frequency or low frequency and you can change it. We can choose our thoughts and we can use this to actually change, instantly change. When we look at that frequency, when you know what frequency is, you know that it's a vibration, you can instantly change it and you can see the results immediately, like within seconds. Focus on the endless possibility potential, the ability that, that you have an infinite power. What you can do right now with technology, you can put out a class like this. Just look at the stuff our heroes do. 
look at the stuff these guys are doing. It's amazing what you can do. You really can do anything at this time in history. It's the most exciting time in history. This is the longest book review we've ever done, guys. Hope that all makes sense. Aristotelians unite. I love you.